one of the things you obviously you mentor on is how can nurses lean on each other? Unfortunately, not all nurses have that connection with a fellow peer on their unit or they feel intimidated because they're new and they don't feel like they have anyone to go to. Having a safe haven like Nurses Teach Nurses is a place for nurses to go find a nurse who's in the same specialty as they are and who can who's available to connect. And yes, you do pay for their time, but they're investing in you, you're investing in them. And it becomes a full circle when you then feel like you can go then be the mentor um, to provide your own mentor service. I'm super pumped um, because we're, of course, back in the studio uh, on Behind the Scrubs, and um, I have today with me a truly exceptional guest, uh, Jenny, um, the founder of Nurses, uh, Teach Nurses, and the CEO of uh, CRNA School Prep Academy and podcast, which you're absolutely crushing based on what you shared uh, with me uh, prior to coming on today. And I know you're super passionate uh, about mentorship, uh, leadership, and obviously your area of expertise as a clinician, uh, CRNA, you obviously have dedicated your life to um, fostering a positive culture for nurses and really providing uh, support through your startup, Nurses Teach Nurses. And, you know, it's clear to me that, you know, you have a, a huge heart, you're super enthusiastic and compassionate, and, and I think you are inspiring and in transforming the nursing profession, really, you know, probably one nurse at a time. So, uh, welcome to the show, Jenny, let's go. How are you doing? Awesome. Thank you, Justin. So honored to be here, and I appreciate that very kind intro. Um, yeah, I'm just excited and honored to share um, all, all about, you know, mentorship, and I know uh, travel nursing is a big aspect that a lot of pre CRNAs are doing. So I thought this would be a great time to kind of share my insight on, on that. And, um, you mentioned how I'm a passionate about leadership. And it's funny because if you would have asked me six years ago, if I was a leader, I would have laughed because I'm incredibly shy, incredibly timid, um, incredibly just very introverted. And I think leadership to me always seemed very scary because I never want to put myself out there. I never wanted to be in the spotlight. Um, it felt very, um, just kind of vulnerable, right? And so I never would have pictured myself doing any of this if you were to ask me six years ago, but I am a very passionate mentor. I've always precepted students in the operating room. And um, prior to CRNA, I was a medical ICU nurse. And so I understand the struggles of what it takes to become a CRNA. And um, I started getting a lot of reach outs on social media on you know how I was how I became a CRNA. And so I started just out of the kindness of my heart, like here's my cell phone, text me anytime. And that is essentially how CRNA School Prep Academy was born because I realized there was not enough information out there. People were facing rejection and not getting any feedback. And so through my connections, I knew a lot of faculty members and CRNA leaders. And so I just started reaching out to my network and really my own mentors and saying, hey, we have a community who needs our help. How can we come together as a community and make this happen for them and, and give them a seat at the table and let them feel that they're included and, and help themselves, really? And so that's kind of how that started. And um, it kind of spilled into Nurses Teach Nurses because I saw the power of mentorship through CRNA School Prep Academy. And one of the things that I really, really love and I value is the fact that when nurses receive mentorship, when they do f find success, the first thing they want to do is give back to other people. They always say, how can I help? How can I then pay it forward? And so I really feel like it's creating this culture of, of pay it forward mentality and, you know, I also, a lot of these nurses are travel nurses. And so they're kind of branching out to this new world. This, a lot of them very scared to go into travel nursing and, and even fearful at times, whether it's going to hinder their ability to become a CRNA. And so I really felt like I could share some really good insights with your audience today about mentorship and, and travel nursing and, and, and things of that nature. I love everything about that. And I, I want to go back uh, real quick to just your uh, sentiment on leadership and getting into leadership and like how that is uh, very uncomfortable. And uh, it is, it takes a lot of courage as um, I'm going to call it out. Uh, Brene Brown would say, you have to dare to lead and um, you have to be vulnerable and put yourself out there uh, because as, as a leader, you don't have all the answers and you're often looked at to have all the answers, right? Or there's just that kind of that expectation um, that you should know everything and, and that's just not the case, right? And that's actually a good thing because then you can lean into the humility, humility 
of that and be like, hey, no, I don't know, or the vulnerability, hey, no, I don't know, I don't have all the answers, but I want to figure them out. We'll figure this out together in those scenarios, right? And it's like, and I think for me, it's like, you know, one of my, as obviously I've been in leadership for a long time now, um, and fortunate to, to work for my team and to serve my team. And, uh, but it's like, hey, you know, it's like, there's so much power in asking questions as a leader when you don't know something is, hey, what do you think about this, Jenny? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or so. Um, but yeah, so I love that. And, and you know, I just want to give you some um, some acknowledgement to that. Like, hey, going through that, you know, experience that process is is not easy. It's hard. But um, clearly you're 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 powering through and you, you know, uh, you're, you're turning that, uh, you know, a little bit of adversity uh, into uh, the, the, the path that that led you to where you are uh, today. Uh, so. Um, mentorship. Let's talk a little bit about that. Cause actually that's, I, you, you touched kind of on, it sounded like I heard that there was a, a moment that you realized mentorship, um, and really community building were essential in nursing. Um, so tell me a little bit more about how that led to the creation of nurses teach nurses. You know, the timing of it all was probably very much so coincidental, but when I launched uh serious prep Academy, it was in February of 2020, about less than two two weeks before, you know, the world seemed to shut down. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like what, what's the future going to hold for nurses? And, um, I mean, I don't want to even, it's hard for me to even reflect back on some of the stories I heard our nurses inside of our academy tell me and all the hardships they went through and seeing just the, the pain and the struggle and kind of the fear, the guilt of not wanting to do bedside nursing, not wanting to be an ICU nurse. And, not feeling like they're getting enough pay for all the hazard, all the uh, potential, you know, they're potentially bringing on something deadly they could, thought they were going to potentially kill their whole family with. And it was very, you know, and as a CRNA um, at the time, I was working in an outpatient surgery center. Well, <laughs> I never in my wildest dreams ever thought my job would become potentially not available. Like, I, I never thought I'd be out of work. And I found myself out of work for the first time. And I, I, again, it was a very big eye-opening moment. Like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this is life-changing. And, um, obviously CRNAs who worked at a level one trauma hospital, a lot of them were being, um, sent to work in the ICUs, doing central lines, intubations and things of that nature. And while I was presented that opportunity, I, I had to, I have three little kids at home and, you know, I'd have to live away from them. It was, it was, I wasn't alone in the struggle of trying to pick between providing for my family and, and potentially protecting my family. And, and so I, I saw all that unfold and I guess, you know, our community was so strong and we all relied on each other to get through that. And we had so many heart to hearts so that we would have like our group sessions and things of that nature. And through that time, I realized just how powerful community was and how nurses need support from their peers. And, it's something about being in the trenches with other people that allows you to connect, that really builds that bond that's so strong versus hearing from someone who's maybe in an office and not maybe seeing what's going on, but has no idea what it's like and being told you need to do this and you do that and here, chin up, here's some pizza or whatever it is. You know how it's built, the whole atmosphere is built a lot of distrust between what I would call the workers and kind of the administrative field. And yeah, some of those administrators are nurses, they're CNOs and you know, but they've maybe been out of the bedside for a while. So nurses started putting up these barriers, these walls of I'm angry, I'm, I'm frustrated, you're not treating me well, I'm, I'm not getting what I need to, to protect myself. And obviously, you know how that unfolded. It, it, it just has created this environment in our current hospitals that is very unsure of what our future holds for nurses in general. And while I don't think, you know, there's any one solution to fix everything, I do think that this is our time. I mean, we have our power in numbers. We have so many nurses. We have over 4 million nurses in the United States. And so I see this as an opportunity, an opportunity to come together and to support one another in a way that we know we need because we know what we need. We've been there. We've we've experienced the struggles and we know exactly what we need. And so I think just giving a, nurses a platform to support one another is really what Nurses Teach Nurses is all about and um, allow nurses to 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 obviously earn additional revenue to be the ones to support other nurses. And kind of in my experience also with CRNA School Prep Academy is a lot of nurses were desiring these one-on-one connection points. They wanted essay edits, resume edits, uh, mock interviews, um, transcript audits, all these things that really require one-on-one time. 
And while I was doing them for a while, I, there was thousands of people who wanted these services and I one person. So I started hiring current students to kind of be contractors. And so I'm like, this could maybe work with other aspects of nursing. And it's so rewarding. Um, the mentors who mentor and teach nurses, they do it because it's rewarding. It's, they get, it's kind of, kind of goes both ways, meaning a mentee and a mentor get mutual benefits out of the relationship. And so they feel really good when they provide them a good service, a good result. And then down the road, they go on to be mentors. And so a lot of these mentees become mentors. And I think this is just fostering that relationship. You mentioned uh, some of the, actually, I guess the, the services or the value that uh, nurses teach nurses uh, provides and offers, you know, a, a range of services from the essay critiques, uh, mock interviews, the mentoring sessions. How do these services contribute to a nurse's like overall career growth and personal development? I have seen specifically, you know, so many nurses want to advance their careers or do something different, right? They're, they feel stuck in a, in a lot of ways. And whether you're an ICU travel nurse or any kind of travel nurse or any, any kind of nurse, really, sometimes it's really scary to make that move or that, that jump to either graduate school, um, doctoral degrees, or even, you know, different units in your hospital when you don't know anything about that specialty. There's, there's over a hundred nursing specialties and some of them are very different. Imagine going from like an OR nurse to a NICU nurse, a neonatal uh, ICU nurse. That's a very big, um, not only patient population difference, but skill set difference. And so sometimes I feel like you need that connection with someone who's, who's done it, who, who has, who has already worked in the NICU, who can give you some reassurance and some guidance on what are the skill set that skill sets that you need? What does a typical day look like? And for career advancement, and really, it's all about satisfaction, whether you want to advance and go on to grad school, that's it's not really about that per se, but it's just about finding that satisfaction within your nursing career. And I'm not saying you need to stay a bedside nurse either, because I know a lot of nurses have found a lot of fulfillment outside of nursing, especially now with the way things have blown up on the internet, right? And that's great as well. But I think it's just about taking care of the person that wants to stay a nurse. You don't go into nursing thinking, I'm going to give it two years and leave. <laughs> and that's what's happening. You don't put all this time and effort to go into school and say, I'm going to give it three years and I'm out. Like, no, this is a career. This is a lifelong career that you pick that you're passionate about. And, and when you ask nurses why they want to become a nurse, they all say the same thing for the most part. I want to help others. And so to give that up, I think a lot of nurses have felt a lot of guilt and, and sorrow and kind of just, you know, and, but I think if other nurses could be there to support other nurses in a way that say, Hey, I'm a NICU nurse. Let me take you under my wing. I can mentor you. I can res edit your resume. I can show you kind of highlight the things that you should be doing to kind of bulk up your resume to make this transition. Um, things of that nature will allow nurses to advance in other ways, especially for grad school too, because like, again, CRNA, you get rejected a lot. Overall acceptance rate is about 15% across the board. So very low. Um, so there's a very big need for one-on-one -on -one mentorship, pursuing things like CRNA, um, FNP. A lot of um, FNPs have a hard time finding um, clinical preceptors. And so they're cold calling people to try to find preceptors for their clinicals. And if they can't find a preceptor, they can't graduate. And so we have a big need to have access to nurses with really specific specialties. And so that's kind of my hope is to provide access to people who do do travel nursing, who can share the insights that they've learned through and i know there's a lot to travel nursing with kind of working you know the agencies and your contracts and trying to get the best you know the best pay and if you're experienced in that you can provide that knowledge to someone who wants to get their foot in the door versus them having to make all these i call them mistakes because sometimes you have to make them but you know if we could lessen <laughs> yeah. that pain a little bit by taking and, and speeding up their progress to find satisfaction that's the whole goal I love that. Mustakes. I'm making a mental, <laughs> mental note of that. Going to use that. Thank you very much. Uh, so something that's interesting, I want to inject into uh, you know, what you're, I mean, one of the things you kind of hit on is uh, like nurses leaving the the profession and then and then also travel, travel nursing and, and, and the, what's the, the contrast there uh, is so like, the, let's just talk the, the current data on the RN shortage is, you know, we're like right now where we sit in 2023, we're roughly, you know, 200,000 uh, RNs short, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is expected to grow up to 450 
thousand by 2025. That's like less than two years. Part of that, there's many drivers and we don't necessarily need to get into the weeds of all the different drivers to that. But um, one of them is, uh, you mentioned nurses are leaving bedside care or we, that's, that's happening. Right. Um, and, and so uh, that, that, that's significant. And that, that trend is continuing, right? The, uh, however, when you look at travel nursing, it's a little bit more optimistic, meaning um, 85 per percent of travel nurses that are traveling now, um, they uh, plan to continue to work as travel nurses, right? They are not going to leave the travel nurse profession. So it seems like uh, more of the nurses that are leaving patient care, bedside care, um, are in other roles like staff roles versus travel. And so maybe um, there's more satisfaction in the travel nurse experience than, than there is as a staff nurse. hundred percent. And I think a lot of that has to do with flexibility, higher pay. Um, and, you know, one thing that I will say, and cause again, I see a lot of our um, students uh, pursuing CRNA go on to travel because they're trying to save money for, for grad school. Um, but the reality is there are also people who cannot travel, who have um, little families at home and it's just not possible for them. And, or maybe, They've been traveling for 10 years and they really want to settle down and start a family. And it, it maybe is not going to, it's maybe not, um, it's not, it works for a while, but it may not be able to do it long term. Right. And, you know, women happen to be the bulk of nursing. I think it's like 85% still. So it's still very much so women. And I'm a mom of three, um, soon to be probably too early announced, but we're having twins. <laughs> like we're going to be a mom of five. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh. I'm like, oh my gosh, I say mom of three. I'm thinking I'm going to be a mom of five. That's insane. <laughs> but you know, my, cause before I had children, you know, and I graduated, my idea of work was so different and it's crazy how much little humans can change your perspective on life and what you really want from your career. <laughs> And so 100%. I think a lot of women are going to face that sooner than later, especially if they've, because a lot of these nurses who are traveling to do to, to tend to be the younger nurses. Right. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of, the reason why they love it is because of the flexibility and the higher pay. Um, they can kind of make set their schedule. And I think hospitals, this is a huge eye opening moment for hospitals to say, this is what needs to be created for staffers. Um, and if they can't figure out a way to create flexibility and better work life balance or life work balance is the way it should be they're going to keep losing nurses. Yep. But I think a lot of it too, is the fact that nurses need to find a, something fulfilling that they enjoy doing. And maybe it's not their current unit. Maybe it's not their current position. Maybe. And I've had a nurse too. I asked her when I was in clinical, I go, why did you pursue CRNA? What was that, that burning point or that tipping point that kind of got you to say, yes, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And her answer was a little bit different than what I've heard other people say. And she said, because she was tired of being disrespected at the bedside. She wanted more control and more autonomy over her patients. And she felt like she had the knowledge and skills to make decisions and she wasn't able to do so. And she flat out said one time during rounds in the ICU, one of the physicians said when she was asking questions, he's like, you don't need to know that you need to stay in your lane. And she's like, whoa, whoa. And, and you know, so and I'm not saying this is the only reason why stuff like this exists, but it, unfortunately it does. But I think nurses... <laughs> It kind of stinks because not only are we women, but like we're, we're, we're kind of facing a lot of men who are physicians, you know, and I think there's a lot of like still some gender um, issues going on, really. But I think we desire that autonomy. We desire to play the role that we have gone to school to do. And I think nurses and I hate when I hear this, they say, I'm just a nurse. That is like the most toxic saying that you could ever say. You're not just a nurse. You are a nurse and you should be very proud of that. So, yeah, and I know, you know I'm getting off topic here, but um you know, no, I, I think, I, this I love it. Where the conversation goes, we go. So uh, okay. keep going. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 you know, I. It's unfortunate that we're going to have so much um, shortages in the near future that we're going to be faced with. And you have to think about it too. I mean, we use healthcare systems all the time. I mean, I would like to have a good epidural and good OB experience, but there's no nurses on the unit. <laughs> you know, I guess we do my own epidural, but you know, it's one of those things where this is going to affect everyone, and so it. it we need to address it together. And I think nurses are the ones who hold the solution and we need a voice. We need to be heard. And I think coming together is really the way to do that. Um, and I hope that whether that's finding a more suitable solution, working as a staffer versus a travel nurse, whatever works, I, I, I hope that we can come to a solution 
to keep nurses wanting to be nurses. I'm with you. I think, you know, there's so many people that are, are, are working hard to try to figure this out. Um, so many smart people uh, that are trying to figure this out. It's a massive problem, a massive challenge. But one of the things that, you know, you mentioned is the flexibility, right? And the, that autonomy and like that is such a catalyst to um, a positive experience um, as a uh, as a healthcare worker at whole, right? So um, having that uh, autonomy to to choose when when I work, how long I work for, ultimately like who am I working with because I can go from one hospital to another. Whether that's as a travel nurse, right today, the traditional traveler that exists today, or even as the traditional per diem nurse that exists mm-hmm. today, or this the new the the, the healthcare gig worker that now exists today. Day, and that's really gaining momentum through all these uh, gig platforms, right? You know, we're you know we uh, we're we're in that that gig space as well, and so um, that's you know it seems like there's a lot of adoption taking place um, uh, from from the uh, clinician uh, perspective, and also now uh, the clients are starting to come more, you know, the facility are coming uh, you know around to to that idea. But it's it's flexibility, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's that high paying flexible lifestyle that does uh, contribute to a higher satisfaction because the work is so hard it's so demanding mentally emotionally uh, physically um and they're you know we're so short-staffed across the country um that just uh amplifies all those factors um but um i think the more we can offer that flexibility uh the 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 more um that impact will have on not just the nursing profession but really the lives of the patients right that need the care that the clinicians are providing yep and i'm prn myself and i i love it <laughs> i would never go back um to a w2 i've also done locums they call them locums instead of travel but kind of a similar concept in the crna world but it it is when especially when you have little kids the the caveat is doing local gigs because um like for, i get call calls all the time for like you know Florida or Dayton, Ohio. I'm in, you know, I don't want to travel more than like 15 minutes away from my home. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah. I think having that yeah. op- those options are nice. I'm very familiar with locum tenants too, actually. Uh, I've uh, been in that space for a handful of years. Um, and so that's all, that is also a good option. And I guess for, you could speak to this more obviously. And actually I would love for you to, to actually talk a little bit more about the, the CRNA profession. I, I feel like I failed to kind of uh, skip over that in the beginning of this conversation, but um, you know, with, you know, d- working locum tenants, which is for advanced practice uh, providers, advanced practice clinicians and, and physicians, similar to, to travel nursing or per DM is kind of a, a, a mixed bag, but uh, talk a little bit bit more um about um how that relates to your you know crna experience also if you can maybe to to tee it up is um like for any nurses that uh listen to this uh episode um that are interested in uh, becoming not so much a travel nurse obviously or work locums on that side of it but uh, maybe they're they're interested in, in becoming a crna and you know what that uh, process is like. We have mentored over 5,000 ICU nurses in the last three years pursuing, uh, yes. So we've, we've seen a lot and I've, I've, I've grown a lot and I've been very, I'm very humble and, and grateful that I've, I've been able to, to provide this type of mentorship. Um, but yeah, so, you know, a lot of tra- travel ICU nurses are, you know, have, you know, they maybe know about CRNA or maybe you're interested, but maybe you're fearful and not really sure if they would cut it. Or I've heard a lot of nurses say they don't feel like they're smart enough or, whatever it is. But I think the first step when you're considering CRNA is kind of assessing where you currently are and also why, why, how would this career change really bring that satisfaction? And really the only way to know that is to actually get in the operating room and see us in action. Um, because mm. you, you should never pick a specialty of any kind until you kind of have a better understanding of what it really entails, which is why I believe mentorship is key. Um, to talk to CRNAs. And, and that was where I was experiencing our students having a lot of problems. They weren't, they didn't have access to us. They didn't have, you know, access to, to have these conversations, um, candid conversations and ask these really vulnerable questions about, you know, maybe I struggle with ADHD. Do you think I could be, I'm going to be a bad CRNA? I'm like, absolutely not. You know, I'm dyslexic. Yeah, I'm dyslexic and I'm a CRNA. And so I think it's just about being human and putting that like, we're, we're still a nurse. We're still people. Um, don't put us on a pedestal and know that you are capable of this career path if this is what you want. 
Um, the It's an amazing profession. I obviously love it. Um, I think it's really fascinating and kind of what brought me to it was the love of pathophysiology, pharmacology, which is also why I loved ICU nursing. I love the critical care think or the critical thinking and like the, the, the disease process and really thinking through like, why are they on this drug? What does this drug do? How does it work? And what's the disease process? And what are some comorbidities they have that would affect this, this drug or this disease process? And challenging myself to think like that all the time was fun. And it kept me engaged with what I was doing. And you do that all the time in the operating room, but now you throw in surgery. So I did open heart surgery for four and a half years. And that was by far my favorite in adults. Um, but there's a lot going on, a lot of fluid shifts. Obviously they're on pump for a while. You're, you know, so there's a lot of, and you know, the heart is the main pump. And so if the heart is failing, there's different types of heart failure and depending on where the blockages are, you know, and so there's a lot of pathophysiology in that uh, process. But, you know, to pursue CRNA, you're looking at um, a doctoral degree, which is a 36 month program. But prior to that, you need at least two, one to two years of high acuity ICU. And I always tell nurses this, it's more about quality than it is quantity. You don't want 10 plus years because you just think you need more qu quantity. You need quality ICU meaning very high acuity, patients on vasoactive drips daily, ventilators, um, ECMO, CRRT, things of that nature, the sickest of the sickest. I would say if the patients are being shipped out because they need care somewhere else, get, get in your car and follow the ambulance and apply to that hospital. So you're, because you're talking, you're talking like experience, like for example, just to add to this is like at level one trauma centers, like working in ICs at level one trauma centers or, or even maybe teaching hospitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't have to be level one trauma. I think a lot of people, that's another misconception. They don't have to be level two is actually the same acuity. It's just not usually a teaching hospital, but they typically um, still have the same acuity of patients. But and you, I've had nurses who work at rural community hospitals get into CRNA school, but they, they take they take very sick patients because they, the patients are too sick to ship out, right? There's, there's, there's they wouldn't yeah. make the flight. And so they're actually very high acuity rural hospitals. And so it, you have to just make that known on your resume which is why resume edits help, right? To have someone who knows what these schools are looking for, look at your resume and say, you need to look, look. And I've read enough resumes to know that nurses do not do themselves justice. They do not, they miss things all the time. Like after I talk to them and I'm like, this is not on your resume. And they're like, well, yeah, I didn't think it mattered. And I'm like, yes, it does matter. So it's just getting yeah. that insight and to make sure you're really selling yourself on your resume, including like, why did you win the Daisy Award? What, like give it a sentence. Like, I wanna know why, why were you recognized for this award? Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that go into it, but it's very competitive. The interview is brutal, depending on where you interview. Some of them are more casual, get to know you, emotional intelligence interviews. Some of them are rapid fire clinical questions. So, which is, I've had ex both experiences um, and it's really intimidating. Sometimes they try to make you frazzled. They try to see if they can upset you. Sure. They want to see how you react under pressure um, because you can get yelled at by surgeons. You can be under pressure in the operating room. And if you can't keep your cool when someone's coming at you, that's kind of like, ugh, like you need to, you need to work on like, you need to work on your self presence. And so sometimes that takes practice because you don't realize that you're clicking your pen, you know, you're nervous and things of that nature. And they're like, ugh, you know, so you don't, you don't have your own cognitive like awareness sometimes when you're under pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you believe are like the most important qualities uh, a nurse should uh, possess uh, for for that, you know, role and mm -hmm. really I mean, just to, to make a, a difference in their their profession and, and the lives of their patients? Yeah, I think I see a lot of CRNAs. I think a lot of people think that you you have to be an introvert or you can't like people like and it's funny. <laughs> I have a shirt that says I like people under general anesthesia, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, like people are like, oh, I'm going to go to anesthesia. I don't have to talk to anyone anymore. Now, that being said, yes, you don't have these conversations with your patients physically, like uh, verbally, but you do physically, right? You're, they're communicating yeah. with you all the time in the OR by their heart rate, their blood pressure, different signs and symptoms of pain. And so you do technically communicate, but it's different, right? But that being said, you can be an extrovert, introvert. That part doesn't matter. But what matters more than your personality type is adaptability, flexibility, and enjoying kind of like a like an always changing pace, meaning no two days are gonna be the same and no two patients are gonna be the same. The surgeries are gonna be different. The patient population's a baby to an adult. Um, I currently work at a peds hospital and so we'll have like an 18 year old who is very much so an adult. And then the next case could be a two day old, right? So very different pathophysiology, different way to give medications, fluids, all of that. 
And so it's, it's kind of being able to be very flexible and enjoying that type of flexibility um, and seeing a variety of cases, you know, a gallbladder versus uh, AV fistula versus a ruptured AAA versus, you know, a cabbage or, you know, I mean, there's so many different types of surgeries that you can do in one day. Um, going up to OB to do an epidural and coming back down to the OR to do, you know, a vascular case. And so it's, it's always changing. Where in the ICU, you typically work with surgical ICU patients, medical ICU patients. And you, so you get really familiar with the types of um, critically sick patients that you tend to specialize in. But in the operating room, we kind of see a wide range of sick, sick patients. Um, and again, different ages, different comorbidities, different surgeries. And so it's, it's very... People think it's a boring job, but it's not. It's it's very much so the opposite. Some cases are what I call, you know, you watch train track vitals and you wake them up. And most of the cases I would say are pretty straightforward and tend to get in a nice rhythm. But yeah, I think you would enjoy adaptability, being adaptable and flexible and enjoy pathophysiology, pharmacology because you do it all day long. <laughs> One of the things you obviously you, um, you I guess, teach on mentor on is uh if i'm a nurse and obviously you're a nurse like is like i i can lean on you right or i can lean on my nursing peers and my nursing community um to achieve my goals um or find support right um or just career growth advancement uh how uh do nurses actually achieve that right like how can nurses lean on each other to uh, accomplish those things I think there's a multiple ways, honestly. I mean, nurse teach nurses is only one aspect of that. I think it, you know, I think obviously having things like resume edits, looking over your personal statements, um, reviewing care plans, I mean, whatever it may be, that's one aspect of lean on your peers. But I, I've, I've, I've seen enough, heard enough, knowing that it's just about that personal connection. And unfortunately, not all nurses have that connection with a fellow peer on their unit, or they feel intimidated because they're new. Or they feel like if they ask questions, they're going to be seen as stupid or that they're not cut it. They're not going to cut it. And so there's this fear and intimidation that can, that culture that can be created on a unit and they don't feel like they have anyone to go to. And so that needs to stop. And while I, that's something that's like inbred that it's really hard to change, but I do think having a safe haven like nurses teach nurses is a place for nurses to go find a nurse who's in the same specialty as they are and who can, who's available to connect. And yes, you do pay for their time, but they're investing in you, you're investing in them. And it becomes a full circle when you then feel like you can go then be the mentor um, to provide your own mentor service because it would be so, it's so impactful to receive that type of connection. And really my hope, honestly, is that these types of connections can become offside, off the internet, meaning maybe you meet someone who's a travel nurse and maybe you enjoy each other so much. Maybe, yeah, you do pay for each other's time in the beginning, but maybe you enjoy each other so much that now you meet you know, you meet your next contract and you become friends. And so and now you always have each other. And so it could just be a way to connect nurses for other future possibilities. But yeah, I think mentorship doesn't have to be one thing. It doesn't have to be by a person who's certified. It doesn't have to be by someone who is higher up than you. It could just, it just needs to be a peer. Um, and, and I think even nursing students have value to offer. I think sometimes the lower you are in that totem pole, you think, oh, I'm, I'm not qualified to be a mentor. I haven't really done anything. <laughs> But if, even as a nursing student to another nursing student, that's a peer to peer mentor. Um, right. You're experiencing the same things, the same struggles, the same annoying, like pick the best answer or select all that apply. <laughs> like, come on, <laughs> help me with these test strategies. This is yeah. insanity. Um, you know, so I, I think it's not about putting a mentor on a pedestal, but it's just about being that real connection that you desire with someone who has achieved something or who has gotten somewhere that you hope to be or that is in the same place as you are. It also sounds like there uh, is the the pay it forward mentality at work too through through this experience. Yeah, hundred percent. So, like, how does that? I, I'm a big believer of mindset and how that mm. Im impacts us um, as humans and professionals. No matter what profession you're in, as uh, parents, etc. Uh, I have children too, as uh, uh, so. But uh, mindset is huge, right? Um, and so, how do you see that mindset of the you know kind of the the pay it forward, the the give without expectation is one way I look at that. Um, how do you see that contributing just to overall improvement of uh, our prof or the nursing profession? 
Oh my gosh, it would be huge. And and the thing is, yes, Nurses Teach Nurses is a platform where it is a marketplace where you, you do pay for mentorship. However, the culture it creates, the pay it forward mentality it creates will not just occur on the platform. It will occur in person on your unit, friend to friend. It's like, it's like when you have someone hold the door for you and then you're like, oh, I'm gonna hold the door for someone behind me. It's, it's just about that. It's just taking that moment in time and, and changing someone's life for the better and having them feel tons of gratitude for you, for who you are. And then thinking, how can I also do this for someone else? Because this was so impactful for me. It doesn't have to be going on to be a mentor, nurse, teach nurses. It could just be going back to your unit and providing a new, a new, a new nurse with the same type of um, open conversation that you experienced with someone on nurses, teach nurses and kind of enlightens you know, the, the person as a whole, that the possibility of having someone who can care about you, who you don't even know them, that it is real, that it is out there and there are nurses. And so I think it's just about creating that um, gratitude and, and mindset is so huge. And I think everyone struggles with mindset. I, I know I do. And I mean, to the point where I think having a coach is so impactful um, because you don't even realize when you get in your own way. And, and I think, you know, the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset, I, I teach that a lot because I think that that's what a lot of people struggle with, um, whether you know it or not. I mean, again, I, I, I think about it all the time and I still catch myself doing it, but it's kind of like the, the process of no, not yet, or no, doesn't mean never. And that, you know, failure creates growth, failure creates opportunities, failures creates, you know, possibilities to, to, to come. And it's not a failure. It's just a way to move forward. It's a way to strategize and, and, and think about how can I do something different? So I think having nurses share those types of struggles with others will go pay dividends even on the unit, not just on the internet, but I think it's going to spill over into their practice. Now you're speaking one of my other languages, gratitude, <laughs> mindset, failing forward. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I just want to okay. echo and, uh, retweet everything you just said, uh, <laughs> because I I'm with you a hundred percent on that. And, um, gratitude. I mean that immediately you, you, if you have a very simple daily gratitude practice as I do, um, actually I have multiple, but uh, start small. Um, and you know, uh, you immediately will shift your mindset. If you're in a, in a negative mindset, right. What, uh, something is, is, is going wrong. Isn't going as planned. Um, there, there is adversity, but if you can think of one thing that you're grateful for, it immediately is going to shift your mindset into a positive one, because what gratitude does is it makes visible what we value. And so, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of power, uh, in it, but to your point, it's not easy. Like it's, it's even for me, I struggle with this stuff from time, you know, still, and, and, uh, it is hard, but, um, the, the impact, uh, for yourself first and then for others is undeniable. Uh, I, I believe that 1000%. No, that's awesome. And I don't know if you mind, if I read a quote, um, <clears throat> that I really like. Ooh, I, I love also... quotes. Yes. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. I like quotes too. Um, and I forget honestly what book this came from. I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of audiobooks, but I, I love things yep. like um Charlie Munger and um Warren um uh Warren Buffett and um just I really anything that would it's it's really and business in itself is really about mindset too. So I, I think that's also why I've really dug into a lot of business um aspects and really thought I could maybe make a difference with it. But anyways, this, this quote is um, constantly comparing yourself to others will only magnify your insecurities and distract you from reaching your full potential. The only one you should compete against is your former self. And I think that that is just kind of speaks to a lot of nurses saying I, I suffer from imposter syndrome and it's because they're playing the comparison game, right? They're not focusing on them. They're focusing on other people and they're kind of remaining stagnant because of that 100 percent, and i literally cannot make this up um is so i wasn't joking i love quotes so we have a daily ritual uh here um at lead and um it's a bit of optimism which is 100 percent a, a steal from simon sinek uh that a bit of optimism and so but mm -hmm. i share a quote with the, with the team after our, our, that's, a, that's how we end every single, uh, team huddle. And then we post it on our, our, um, 
our intranet uh, too. So the, today's quote, I, I, again, I cannot make this up. Today's quote is, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Ah, oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. And yes. I love that ritual. <laughs> I'm going to have to adopt that too. <laughs> Very uh, cool. Um, so no, punchline is, yeah, I love that your quote. Um, cause, and I obviously, again, I, I, I agree with, it's like, just, you gotta, you get, am I making progress? I gotta look, you know, uh, you know, reflect, am, am I getting better? You know, 1% every day or have I progressed? Have, am I, you know, get back to growth mindset is like, you know, have I improved? Have I learned something new? Right. Cause guess what? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can learn new things. Uh, I can get smarter. I can even evolve positive character traits, right? Uh, too. So, um, what piece of advice would you give to nurses, um, you know, who are maybe just starting their careers or they're struggling, right. Uh, to, um, gain traction with their development in their, in their growth in the, in their current roles. I love that you asked this question because I really think this is a really important aspect of the struggles we're currently facing with, uh, people leaving bedside and things of that nature. Um, there's been a lot of reports and surveys that prove that nurses that are leaving the bedside are the younger nurses, the nurses who have not been, at, who have not been practicing for very long. And they also are the ones struggling the most with mindset and, and things like anxiety and depression. And I had a conversation that I, I, you know, that I think potentially can unravel some of this. And I think a lot of it has to do with the younger nurses do tend to take the more stressful positions, right? They do tend to take the ICU positions. Um, I also think that the fact that we just went through a two year pandemic, that they were like thrown into the fire. Um, I've had nurses tell me that, you know, they were promoted to like nurse manager with like six months of experience and not given any guidance and just told, here you go. You're now the charge nurse or the nurse manager. And they're the most senior person on their unit, which is on, you know, and I, I just think that then, then when they fail or when they don't do well, or when they struggle, they take it personally when it's not their fault. And, and it, it just, they were not given the support and the tools they needed to be successful. And they made it a negative reflection on who they are as a person. And they had a lot of guilt and resentment around that, which made them not like their profession. Right. And I think, you know, going forward, I think it's just about us. The fact that we have power numbers, the fact that nurses are the ones who care, we do care about each other. And it may not always seem like that. Okay. Because we do go through a lot of bad days together as well. But at the end of the day, we understand what we go through because we have also lived it. And so I think we are the ones who have the solution to create the change. Um, we have the power in numbers, and I think we need to foster that that pay it forward and that culture of, of gratitude uh, for each other. Because really, at the end of the day, sometimes it's kind of really all you have is, are other nurses who understand what you're going through. And so we need to lean on that. We need to pick each other up and support younger nurses to find a, a fit, to find that satisfaction. Um, and not saying we don't need to nurture older nurses too. I think it can go both ways. I actually think a lot of experienced nurses will find a lot of um, gratitude and a lot of um, fulfillment in nurturing their young, right? And, and, and you learn a lot too, as a preceptor, as a mentor, you learn a lot from your younger peers because they read all those textbooks, right? And you're like, oh, <laughs> I didn't remember that. And it, it, it creates this, kind of just both ways where you're both being empowered. And, and so, yeah, I think that that could be the way that I think we could support our younger nurses is by providing opportunities for them to connect with either experienced nurses or fellow nurses that are in the same peer to peer group that they can feel like they can ask safe questions. Again, I'll just, I'll just hit it, hammer it one more time is, uh, seek out uh, an opportunity to practice gratitude. If start if you start with one thing in terms of mindset, in terms of growth, et cetera, like is if you can start practicing uh, gratitude and uh, for yourself, um, you'll get uh, good old dopamine hits from that. You give gratitude to others, uh, they will get dopamine hits from that, and um, that'll just create positive, more positivity, and and help foster that that supportive environment, supportive community, and culture, etc. So gratitude mm -hmm. is a game changer, uh, one one thousand percent. So uh, before we wrap this up, this has been exceptional. Um, is I. Uh, would love to invite you to do, uh, we started doing this a few episodes ago, um, is where we just do a, a rapid fire round, three questions 
in 30 seconds or less is your response time on that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, how do you feel about that? Are you, are you game? I, I love it. I'm game. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so if you could have one superpower to improve your efficiency, as a nurse, what would it be? Be able to understand the from the beginning to the end what the patient comorbidities are and how it's affecting the disease process and what you're actually out to do and achieve. If you had to be stuck in one year of your nursing career forever, uh, which year would it be? Probably in my second year as a CRNA because that's when I felt like I finally had my footing and, and I was, I still love what I do, but I was really loving what I was doing. If you were given the opportunity to uh, have dinner with any uh, figure in the history of healthcare or medicine, um, who would it be? I actually think it would just be nice, even though I have never actually even met my hospital CEO. I think it would be nice to have a sit down dinner with them because I would love to feel heard. I'm curious on that, uh, just your thoughts, because I, I know how important that is uh, for uh, for nurses to, because this is something we uh, experience and kind of, you know, are aware of and, and, and try to be better at um, with the nurses that we work with on a daily basis is that is that nurses want to feel heard and they want to feel understood and part of that from my experience experience is because they they want to they want to feel like we have their back right um and that we're there mm -hmm. to to support them so what do you for you um and go look just in that hypothetical scenario you're at dinner with the ceo of your hospital what is it that you would want his undivided attention on like where he is like actively listening, right? So he is just listening to Jenny to understand, not to respond. Uh, what would you tell him? I would love to share the insights I have with how nurses are feeling currently at the bedside and different solutions and possibilities that we could as an organization work towards achieving and why that those matter and why I think they would drive results in the business. Um, I would love to just share that I, I think that there are solutions that are not expensive that they could be implementing um, and doing today and, and you know, make a huge impact down the road. Hopefully, uh, maybe your CEO will hear this episode <laughs> of uh, Behind the Scrubs. Uh, all the CEOs. I'd we'll like do to our best. Talk to uh, them we'll, all. We'll, we'll, we'll do, yeah, all the CEOs. There you go. Well, uh, you've been been incredible. I, I feel like I'm just maybe a very micro bit smarter because your um, everything you shared today uh, was was super like for me informative and educational too. Um, and Thank you, you just uh, seem like an exception. My pleasure. Yeah. And see, cause you seem like an exceptional human and you're doing super positive things out there in, in our world of healthcare and nursing. So keep up the great work. And before we go though, um, we gotta, we gotta plug, um, uh, nurses teach nurses, uh, the CRNA school prep Academy and your podcast. So where can, uh, people find those platforms and connect with you online? If you're interested in becoming a CRNA, you can find me on any YouTube, Instagram, uh, podcast at CRNA School Prep Academy. Um, if you are interested in being a mentor or receiving mentorship services, you can find us on Instagram, on um, TikTok, on um, YouTube, and all the things that nurses teach nurses. Well, thank you again. Uh, and I, I want to give you gratitude, obviously, for making the time to, to come on and, and for connecting with me and um, and for uh, just, you know, again, po you're positively impacting uh, your community's ability to thrive. So I appreciate you and all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Justin. It was an honor. Mm -hmm.